not far from a school playground, a search for a murder weapon. A knife used to stab this man, James Atfield, 102 times. Detectives say they have no leads. They admit they're baffled. Somebody somewhere must have seen or heard or know something. This kind of person continues to attack until they are caught. We've all got family and friends and kids that, you know, play around here. There's someone out there that's obviously killing people, you know, and they haven't really linked anything yet, so, you know, who knows what's going on, to be honest. With no suspect and no motive, but a great deal of fear, in Colchester tonight, people are being told to be alert. Now, police have appealed for calm after revealing that a Saudi Arabian student murdered on a footpath at Colchester in Essex on Tuesday was stabbed 16 times. This uh, Saudi Arabian student, Nahid al um, her case was also being linked to another case, I think back in March it was, that of James Atfield. There are clearly some similarities with two knife attacks. And this is a possibility that is being explored. Okay. Some of the voices were talking to me, you need to make a sacrifice or we're going to come and get you, you need to do it. I saw him. This is the story of James Fairweather, the UK's youngest serial killer. If you're a fan of true crime content, don't forget to subscribe. On August 5th, 1998, James Fairweather was born in Colchester, Essex. By all accounts, James had a fairly normal childhood in which he was described by his teachers as a quiet, gentle boy. But by the time he entered high school, he started to exhibit some drastic changes in behaviour. The peaceful young boy was gone, and in his place stood a withdrawn, causic, angry young man who was known for being the school bully. His rages were initially brought on by his classmates, who antagonised him for his protruding ears. Unearthed school reports on Fairweather revealed his tendencies to descend into violent rages in which he would punch walls, throw furniture and scream inappropriate words at his peers. His wrath was felt by his teachers too. One such incident involved Fairweather lunging at a frightened school employee because he believed they were observing him for nefarious purposes. Another account given by a former classmate stated that when Fairweather was asked about his career choices, he responded that he wanted to become a murderer. His peers somewhat cautiously laughed off his remarks as no more than dark humour. They would soon find out just how wrong they were. On March 29th, 2014, James snuck out of his parents' home in the middle of the night with the intention of finding someone to kill. He happened upon 33-year-old James Atfield, who had fallen asleep in a park after a night of drinking. Fairweather proceeded to stab the half-conscious man all over his torso over 100 times. He left Atfield to bleed out on the grass and returned home around 2.30am. When paramedics finally found Atfield almost four hours later, he was miraculously still alive, despite losing nearly all the blood in his body. Unfortunately, he would succumb to his wounds just an hour later. The police scoured the surrounding cities and town in search of the suspect, but to no avail. In a sick twist of irony, just three days prior to Atfield's murder, Fairweather had been placed under a juvenile probationary period following an attempted robbery at Knife Point. The conditions of his probation were limited at best, with no real effort at monitoring the troubled teen who had been allowed to continue living at home. For the next several months, while the authorities continued the search for Atfield's killer, James Fairweather descended into an obsession with notorious serial killers like Jack the Ripper. Photos of Peter Sutcliffe were found in his possession and he had researched the Stockwell Strangler, Kenneth Erskine, Ipswich serial killer, Steve Wright, and US murderer, Ted Bundy. A child psychiatrist would later testify that Fairweather had discussed his urges to rape, mutilate, and burn women and prostitutes. After months of staying under the radar, Fairweather decided it was time to strike again. In sweltering heat, they search, looking for anything that will help identify a killer. And now after three attacks in as many months, two of them murders, police say there may be a link. A decision has been taken that at this time the investigations will remain separate but will be conducted in parallel with each other. 
However, the circumstances of both crime mean that we must consider the possibility that the same killer or killers are responsible for both murders. Certainly here in Colchester today, the police presence is enormous. There are police cars patrolling everywhere, not just here close to the scene. You can see the police tape here. It's through those bushes on the Salary Brook Trail here in Colchester that Nahid Almania's body was found. He really didn't think it was that urgent. He put his shoes on and he took the dog with him. And when he got there, that's when he found loads of blood and this poor girl lying on the floor, which he immediately rang for the ambulance and they asked him if he could do CPR and he said it's too late for that. Police are still trying to establish whether Colchester just happened to have two completely separate brutal killings or whether they're the work of just one person. The Chief Inspector of Essex Police has described these crimes as an attack on the entire community. His next victim, who he chose entirely at random, was 31-year-old Saudi Arabian student Nahid al -Manir. On June 17, 2014, the 15-year-old stabbed Miss al with a bayonet while she was making her way to the University of Essex campus. She was walking along a well-travelled path called the Salary Brook Trail in broad daylight when Fairweather approached her silently from behind and pierced her directly in the kidneys. While he didn't stab his second victim with the same ferocity as his first victim, Fairweather ensured an equally gruesome killing by running the bayonet through Almania's eyes into her brain so that she could not see evil. This mention of seeing evil is the first instance in which James's possible schizophrenia came to light. During James's deposition, another psychiatrist would go on to state that Fairweather had discussed hearing voices that would dictate their desire for him to commit these atrocious acts. It was the same psychiatrist who would definitively diagnose young James as being on the autism spectrum. When questioned by prosecutors about how he spent his time after Almania's murder and prior to his arrest, a period of more than a year, the now 17-year-old Fairweather said that he did not kill again because the public's interest in murders was too high. To his unsuspecting advantage, the residents of Colchester didn't believe that one of their neighbours could be responsible for the killings, and the public investigation was prioritised to the suspects who didn't live in the area. But was he ever identified as a suspect? Not in specific terms, he wasn't. But he was one of the nearly 70 people that the police interviewed the days after Almania's killing, along with his mother, who was accompanying him due to his status as a minor. Fairweather was interviewed about the murders, but he told police that he was at home when they were committed. His mother, who suspected nothing about her son, confirmed his story. He was given leave to return home, no longer a suspect in the gruesome Colchester killings. There was no obvious connection between Atfield and Fairweather, and investigators certainly weren't looking for a 15-year-old boy, regardless of criminal history. Mr Atfield and Miss Almania were very different victims, one a white British male, the other a Saudi Muslim woman, and Mr Atfield was killed at night, Miss Almania during the day. Investigators were initially considering the possibility that there were two serial killers. In an interview with the trial's conclusion, Crown Prosecutor Paul Scoffin said, There was very little forensic or physical evidence from the crime scene, or from the bodies that enabled the police to follow lines of inquiry that would lead to any individual. On May 27, 2015, the investigation into the media-dubbed Colchester murders finally caught up with James. A resident of Colchester, Michelle Sadler, was out walking her dog near the area where Nahid Almania was murdered. Officer got close enough, so when he looked at me, I looked back at him, I felt really, really sort of scared, panicked, I turned round, went back on where I was, um, and that's when I obviously decided I needed to call the police, but I wasn't 100% certain, because I thought, you know, if he hasn't done anything, do I or don't I? And you could have been just seconds away from yeah, him? Yeah, if I'd have gone in five minutes later, which is what I already knew, where he was in that bush, I, I know that he'd have got me from behind, and I know that, and um, yeah, that's the most horrific part, you know, obviously reading that in the statements, what's been come out in court. Yeah, you know, I'm just very, very lucky to be here. Yeah. When she realised that he was also wearing latex rubber gloves, a chill went down her spine. She quickly dialed the authorities and relayed what she saw to police dispatch. Within minutes, officers descended in mass to the Salary Brook public trail and James Fairweather was arrested without incident. During questioning, he admitted to the killings, and from there was promptly booked for a trial. Okay. 
some of the voices were talking to me you need to make a sacrifice or we're going to come and get you you need to do it and I saw him it was, where it was on, laying on the grass like, like that it was like ah, this place, just fast asleep where he was drunk then he goes he goes he's the one he's the one he's the one do it, do it. so I went up to him can I stand up no. yes went up to him stood over like that we're not that. I stabbed him first there. And I've done it a few times. While I was doing that, my voices were laughing and laughing and laughing louder and louder. Despite the law that forbids the release of James Fairweather's identity because he was a minor, word will get out anyway. The nation was gripped by the trial of the 17 year old who, despite his young age and perceived childlike innocence, committed acts of such a vile, grotesque nature. By this point, Revelations of the defendant's proposed mental illness had not made the rounds of the media circuit, so the public remained fixated on what could have possibly made such an unassuming young man snap. The defence team assembled to represent James Fairweather immediately entered a not guilty plea with regards to outright premeditated murder, but rather acknowledged the two charges of manslaughter on the grounds of insanity. During questioning, Fairweather admitted to the killings but claimed the voices in his head told him to do it. At the time of his arrest, he stated that he was hiding in the bushes, ready to attack on the advice from the inner monologue of these so-called voices. Further psychological evaluation would dispute his claims of schizophrenic psychosis, but psychiatric investigators would go on to testify in their belief that Fairweather was accurately diagnosed as autistic. This diagnosis, however, would not diminish the young man's culpability for the crimes. He was sentenced the following week, on April the 29th, to a life imprisonment with no chance of parole for the first 27 years. <laughs>